So Persia is followed by Greece, and this is when a lot of Daniel's prophecies came to fulfillment in that Grecian era. Stunning accuracy in Daniel's prophecies. Greece was followed by the Fourth Empire during the times of the Gentiles, Rome. And all this time, the nation of Israel remains the owner of her blessings, but not the possessor of her blessings. Owner of the blessings, Abrahamic covenant, but not the possessor of her blessings, Mosaic covenant, because they've never fulfilled their condition. What's the condition? You have to enthrone the king of God's own choosing. Once that happens, you'll not just be the owner, but the enjoyer, and the kingdom of God will come to the earth. Deuteronomy 17, verse 15, you shall set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. Now that Mosaic covenant and condition points to who? Jesus Christ. Jesus said if you believe Moses, the Mosaic covenant, in other words, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. And guess when Jesus showed up? He showed up during the reign of Rome. And what the nation of Israel had an opportunity to do during the lifetime of Christ is they had an opportunity to enthrone their king because he was present amongst them. And had they done that, they would have not just been the owner of their blessings, but the what? Possessor, and the kingdom of God would have come. And this presentation of the king to the nation of Israel so that they could have their millennial kingdom is known as the offer of the kingdom. And it's an offer that was presented by John the Baptist in Matthew 3, verse 2. That's why I had you open there. And then it's presented by Christ himself in Matthew 4, verse 17. And then it's presented by the 12 apostles that Jesus sent out to preach this offer in Matthew 10, verses 5 through 7. And then it's presented a fourth time by the 70 that Jesus sent out in Luke chapter 10. And the expression is used four times, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what it is saying is the king is here. He showed up during the empire of Rome. Rome, the Jews hated, by the way, because of heavy taxation and took away their right to execute their own criminals. That's why Christ was not stoned to death, but he was pierced because Rome was in control. He was crucified. The Jews hated the Romans. And Jesus showed up and said, I'll overthrow Rome right now. I'll bring in the millennial kingdom. All you have to do is fulfill the condition in the Mosaic Covenant, which is to enthrone the king of God's own choosing. So this is what is known as the offer of the kingdom. And the offer of the kingdom always has these same words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John the Baptist preached. And then Jesus preached it in Matthew 4, verse 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in Matthew 10, 5 through 7, Jesus took the 12 and sent them out to preach it. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus sent out the 70 in Luke's gospel. Luke 10, verse 9. Say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So this is what is known as the offer of the kingdom. So here we're looking at, related to the offer of the kingdom, five questions. What does he mean by the kingdom? What does he mean when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Why does he call it the kingdom of heaven? Number three, why does he say it's at hand? What does that mean? Number four, who was it offered to? And number five, and this is a big deal, 
is this the identical message of personal salvation that we preach today? Because there's a lot of preachers, a very prominent one that I'll actually name by name uh, a little later, who sees no distinction between the offer of the kingdom and the gospel of personal salvation. And he merges the two together. And he ends up preaching a garbled gospel. Because he doesn't recognize basic dispensational distinctives. So that fifth question uh, actually is an important one. I mean, when we try to win the lost, do we go up to them and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Is that what we're supposed to be saying? So here we go. Number one, what does he mean by the kingdom? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice this. It's very important. It's the Greek word basileia, kingdom. You notice that the kingdom is not defined here. He never says, by the kingdom I mean this or I mean that. So how do you think we should define what the kingdom means? Any thoughts? Well, it's lessons one through five. We should pour into that word, not some weird meaning, but everything we've studied so far. The fact that it's undefined means that we should define it by everything that is preceded in the Bible concerning the kingdom, which we've diligently studied. We've gone through the whole Old Testament. We've shown very clearly what the kingdom is. Jesus is speaking to Jews. He's expecting them to know Hebrew Bible. And the problem is when people see this word kingdom, they just fill it with whatever they want it to mean. And they don't carefully study what God has revealed up to that point. Because the fact that it's left undefined is a major clue that we're supposed to define it by prior revelation. So everything we've studied in lessons 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, that's what you pour into the expression kingdom as that kingdom is being offered by John the Baptist, Jesus, the 12, and the 70. Now, Michael Kokoris makes a great point here in one of his books. He says, the nature of communication is such that once authors define a term, they are obligated to use that term the same way until they notify the readers otherwise. So the word kingdom comes at you in the New Testament. It's never defined. He never says by kingdom I mean X, Y, and Z. He just gives you the word kingdom. So he's expecting that term to be filled with everything that the Bible has revealed already concerning the kingdom. Now that's what people don't do in their Bible study. They're they're unfamiliar with the Old Testament. So they see the word kingdom and they say, well, it's just, you know, a liver quiver or whatever in my heart. But that's not what he means when he says kingdom. He leaves it undefined because everything that we've studied in the Old Testament is supposed to be poured into that definition. So Arthur Pink, and I quote a lot in my book, Arthur Pink, and Arthur Pink was very good early on. Towards the end of his life, he took, a, he took a, a trend away from the viewpoint that we're representing here. He became very reformed. But young pink is better than old pink. Can I put it that way? And what he said in his younger years is just dead on. It's just excellent. But don't take that to mean everything he said throughout his life is great because it's not But all the quotes I use of Arthur Pink come from early Pink. And he writes this. He says, in Daniel 2, verse 44, we are told, in the days of those kings, the kingdom before referred to, shall shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, etc., He says, further details are given in Daniel 7. After Daniel, the voice of the prophecy was soon silenced. And for 400 years, the people of Israel remained in a state of eager expectation, waiting for God to fulfill his promises. 
Next appeared John the Baptist, who took up the kingdom message just where the Old Testament prophets had dropped it. Between Malachi and John the Baptist, there's 400 years of silence. No prophetic utterance at all. So John the Baptist picks up the message of the kingdom exactly where Malachi and all the other prophets left it. He's not coming up with a new definition of the kingdom. He says... In Matthew 3, 1 and 2, we we read, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was at hand, because the king himself was about to appear in the midst of the Jews. When John the Baptist said, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, what do you suppose his Jewish hearers understood by that expression? They had the whole of the Old Testament in their hands, but that is all which they had. Obviously, all their thoughts would naturally turn to the kingdom which the Son of Man was to receive in heaven at the hands of the Ancient of Days. So when in early Matthew you see this expression, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom, the basileia, is the millennial kingdom that we've studied carefully. If it were something else, you'd have another definition introduced. But the fact that it's undefined means it's got to be defined by prior revelation. Number two, why is it called the kingdom of heaven? A lot of people think this means, well, it's just kind of the spiritual reign of Jesus in my heart. But that's not what the kingdom of heaven means. You'll notice Daniel 10, verse 7, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why is it called the kingdom of heaven? Answer, because it comes from heaven to the earth. The stone cut without human hands, Daniel 2, comes from heaven to the earth. So heaven is not making a statement about the nature of the kingdom like it's some kind of allegorical kingdom or spiritual kingdom. It's called the kingdom of heaven because that's the location from which it travels. From heaven to the earth, once the nation of Israel receives this offer. Remember what Daniel 2 verse 44 says, In the days of those kings, the ten king confederacy of the Antichrist, the God of, what does it say? Heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. John Walvoord says, what did John mean by kingdom of heaven? While the precise phrase is not found in the Old Testament, it is based on Old Testament terminology. Uh, He goes on and he says, this was likewise to be fulfilled by the prediction in Daniel 2 verse 44 that the God of heaven would set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. Matthew alone of New Testament writers uses the kingdom of heaven and rarely uses the expression kingdom of God, which often is often used in parallel passages in the Gospels and throughout the New Testament. Most expositors consider the two terms identical. There's a big debate on the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The truth of the matter is they're both the same. There's no difference between the two. Why do I say that? I say that because of Matthew 19, which you might want to look at just for a minute. Matthew 19, verses 23 and 24. And if you're using the Schofield Reference Bible or you're a student of Lewis Berry Chafer, who I adore, by the way, Lewis Berry Chafer, I'm a president of a school named Chafer Theological Seminary, you probably think there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven because that's what Schofield believed. And that's what Chafer believed. And although I love Chafer, I don't think he was right on this point. 
because I think kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are synonyms. They're interchangeable. And I think that becomes obvious when you look at Matthew 19, 23, and 24. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He just uses them both interchangeably. He's talking about the same kingdom. Matthew likes the expression kingdom of heaven more than kingdom of God. He uses the expression kingdom of heaven more than kingdom of God for the simple reason that Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. Unlike Mark, unlike Luke, unlike John, Matthew is writing to a Hebrew Christian audience and devout Jews don't like to use the name God either in written form or verbal form. In fact, when you're dealing with a Jew, my former secretary was a devout Jewish woman when she would sign emails and she had to include the name God, she would put a dash where the vowel is because to her it was blasphemous to use God's name in, in a, a common way. So Matthew typically will sometimes say kingdom of God, but he doesn't like saying that. He'll use the expression kingdom of heaven. Luke, on the other hand, writing to a Gentile audience. Mark, on the other hand, writing to a Gentile audience, is very comfortable using the expression kingdom of God. But kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are synonyms. They're both talking about the millennium or the thousand-year reign of Christ. And it's sometimes called the kingdom of heaven because the millennium is going to come from heaven to the earth. Isn't that what we're supposed to be praying for, by the way? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why are we supposed to pray that way? Because it comes from the heaven to the earth. Kingdom of heaven, which is a synonym or interchangeable for the kingdom of God. Both are speaking of the millennium. Number three, what does it mean by at hand? John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that even mean, at hand? It's the Greek word, engaizo. And when you look at that verb carefully, engaizo, It means any moment appearance. Uh, Arthur Pink writes, it was at hand. Why? Because the king was about to appear in the midst of the Jews. Jesus was present. The king was present. That generation had an opportunity to do something that no prior generation ever had an opportunity to do. They could right then and there enthrone the king of God's own choosing the condition of the Mosaic Covenant would have been satisfied. Israel would not just be the owner, but the what? Possessor of her blessings, and the Millennial Kingdom would have appeared, just like that. That was what was being offered to that nation in the first century. And when you look at the parsing of this particular verb in Gaizo, in these passages, you'll see it's the same parsing that's used of in Gaizo in James 5, verse 8 which says, you too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. That's the same use of the word in Gaizo. And everybody interprets James 5, verse 8, as the Lord, via the rapture, could appear at any second. We understand that, right? We haven't gotten to the rapture yet, but the Lord can come back in the next split second. The Lord could even interrupt my Bible study lesson. Some of you are probably praying for that to happen. And so in the same way, Jesus was present, the king was present, and if Israel had responded to the condition, the kingdom would have been immediately presented to them. It was that close. It was in a state of eminency. It was in a state of expectation. Why? Because Jesus was there. The king was there in their midst. Number four, 
to whom was the kingdom offered? Well, John preached it, Jesus preached it, then, he, then Jesus sent out the 12 to preach it, and who did he send out the 12? When he sent out the 12 to preach it, who were they supposed to go to? It's very clear here in Matthew 10, 5 through 7. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them. Look at this. You're going to use this at your missions conference, this verse here? You're going to use this verse at your Christ for the Nations conference? Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter any city of the Samaritans. Well, how exclusive can you get here? But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Florida. No, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See that? It's crystal clear. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was not an offer for the world. It was not an offer for the United States. It was not an offer for any Gentile country. It was an offer for Israel. Why? Because Israel is the covenanted nation. Only she and her response, based on the covenantal structure that we've studied, could bring in the kingdom. So this was an offer only given to Israel. There's an interesting story that's told of Christ a few chapters later in Matthew 15. Remember the Syro Phoenician woman? He answered and said, I was only I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then remember what she said? Gosh, even the dogs can eat some crumbs that f- fall off the table. In other words, by faith, she was recognizing who he was. And God's own nation wasn't recognizing it. He says, I can't find faith anywhere in this whole nation other than through this Gentile, Syrophoenician woman. But in the process of that exchange, he says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why would he say something like that? Because early in his ministry, he offered the kingdom to the Jews. It wasn't an offer for anybody else. And I'm telling you, and people get kind of hot and bothered about this because they want me to explain election versus free will and all this stuff, which I can't explain. I mean, that's like way above my pay grade. I don't understand how sovereignty and free will work. If you understand all that, then I need you to come up here afterwards and sign my Bible because... You're at a level of spirituality, you know, most people will never get to, because I think it's impossible to understand the two. I mean, somehow it's predicted that Israel is going to reject the offer. And I'll show you those passages in just a second. But also, the nation was given a bona fide offer. They were given a choice. And then the question becomes, well, what would have happened if they had accepted the offer, if it was a real choice? I don't know. That's like asking, what if Eve had never, Adam and Eve had never sinned? If Adam and Eve had never sinned, because they had a real choice, didn't they, in Eden? How could Jesus be the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth? I mean, if they never sinned, there'd be no need for him to die. So how could he be the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth? And so it's one of these very interesting questions of election versus free will. I stopped trying to figure all that out a long time ago. I just let both have their place and their tension. In fact, rather than all this bothering me, it actually makes me want to worship God more. Because it shows me that, that, that God wrote this book. Because I don't think man could have written something like this. Uh, man wants to buttonhole God into one category or the other. Either we're going to camp on sovereignty and reject free will, or we're going to camp on free will and reject sovereignty. That's how man works. Do you really want a God that's just as smart as you? I don't want that. I like the passages that say, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. Rather than becoming resentful and upset about these kind of issues, why not just use it to worship the Lord, worship the Lord more? I like what the Apostle Peter says in Acts 2.23. 
when he is speaking to the leaders of Israel, he says, this man was delivered over by the predetermined and foreknowledge of God. That's sovereignty. This man was delivered over by the predetermined and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross. So that looks to me like he says, you killed Christ. But then the first part of the verse says it was God's predetermined will for Christ to die. So which is it? It's both. So what I think is happening is this is a real offer that they had a chance to accept. And had they accepted it, the millennial kingdom would have come. And you say, well, then how would have Christ have died to pay for the sins of the entire world? I don't know. Maybe the Romans would have come and tried him for insurrection and nailed him to a cross. I don't know. But somehow both had to be fulfilled. But the Jews rejected the offer. They turned Christ over to Rome for execution. God took lemons and turned it into lemonade, which is God's specialty, right? God took a tragedy of history, the rejection of the offer of the kingdom, and used it to pay the sin debt of the whole world. God used their rejection of his son to accomplish his purpose of the redemption of the whole world through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And then we just praise the Lord throughout the ages saying, oh God, only you could do that. Only you could take the free will of your enemies to accomplish your will. So why not, let's just, let's just let both have their place. This was a free offer and they turned it down through volition and the moment they turned it down, they were fulfilling a blueprint ordained from the foundation of the earth. Kind of like Judas. I mean, Judas made a decision to betray Christ, not even for 30 pieces of gold, but for 30 pieces of silver, which is a lower caliber than gold. And the moment he turned to the religious leaders, the 30 pieces of silver, through his own volition... Through his own free will, he just fulfilled the book of Zechariah, written 500 years ago. Zechariah, what is it, chapter 11, right in there, verse 17, roughly. So what's happening here is a real exchange, a real decision they had to make. And as they made that decision, they were setting the stage for God's ultimate plan, is what I think is happening. But had they hypothetically accepted the offer... The, the millennial kingdom would have come. Don't ask me how or why or how would this happen. I don't know. I just know this is what I think the Bible is teaching. Arthur Pink says, Had Israel remained in subjection to their king and obeyed his laws, not only would he have continued in their midst, but through them he would have governed the whole earth as he will yet do in the millennium. And this is what is called the gospel of the kingdom. What does gospel mean? Good news. It would have been good news for Israel because Jesus would have assumed his throne. Rome would have been thrown off their backs. And Israel would have been elevated from the tail to the what? To the head. That's the gospel for them. It was national it was a national gospel. Now, is this identical to the offer of personal salvation today? When we evangelize the lost, do we say to them, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? I hope you don't say that, because that's not what you're supposed to say, because we're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom today. Why aren't we preaching the gospel of the kingdom today? Well, because the king is not here. Well, where is the king? He's at the right hand of the Father. He's not physically present, giving the covenanted nation an opportunity to respond. That whole scenario is gone. It's dead and gone. It's been gone for 2,000 years. We don't preach the offer of the kingdom to the lost. We preach the offer of personal salvation. Now, the preacher that I mentioned is John MacArthur. I agree with a lot of the things John MacArthur 
says, I even agree with what he's doing right now with civil disobedience. I think he's on the right track with that. That's my personal view. But John MacArthur, let me tell you something. He does not distinguish between kingdom gospel and offer of personal salvation. He takes the two and he merges them together. And that's why I think he presents to the lost a gospel that is somewhat garbled and confused because he never took my kingdom course. (laughs) So John MacArthur says this in one of his sermons, listen, the Jews were looking for a political kingdom, but Jesus never offered one. Well, I think Jesus did offer one. I've just shown you the verses where he offered one. He goes on and he says what Jesus was actually preaching in early Matthew was he was preaching salvation, personal salvation. No, he was not. He was preaching national salvation to the Jewish nation. How do I know that? Because Jesus offered this to who? Only the house of Israel. Now, when you get to the end of Matthew's gospel, as Jesus is commissioning the church that's about to be birthed on the day of Pentecost, he says something different. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of who? Just the Jews. Whoops, doesn't say that. Of all nations. Well, how do you explain that verse in light of Matthew 10, where he was... He told them to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I mean, why are they told only to go to the lost sheep of house of Israel in Matthew 10, but in Matthew 28, he says, go to all the nations. What happened? Well, in between Matthew 10 and Matthew 28 is Matthew 12. That too. But the key chapter is chapter 12. Because in chapter 12 the nation rejected the offer. And in what verse did they reject the offer? They rejected the offer in Matthew 12, verse 24, where the religious leaders attributed Christ's miracles to who? Satan. And the moment they did that, offer withdrawn. They've gone too far. They're not going to receive the kingdom. And that offer will disappear from Matthew's gospel and will not surface again until Jesus describes the tribulation period in Matthew, which chapter? 24, when it will be preached again subsequent to the rapture of the church by the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. So in the interim, that offer is withdrawn, that offer has been rejected, that offer in legal terms has been revoked, it is off the table, and now Christ has turned his attention to the church because the nation of Israel is moving off into discipline. They turn down the offer. And the gospel we preach is this. The Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? That's a great question, isn't it? He doesn't say, what must we do for Israel to receive the kingdom? He says, what must I do to be saved? I don't want to go to hell. I was a 16-year-old in a youth group, and I heard about hell. I went to a Baptist camp, and they talked about hell all the time. I mean, every single lesson was hell, 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 Uh, you know. And they were, they, they were good at that. They weren't really good at how to stay out of hell. But I, didn't want, I knew about hell. I didn't want to go to hell. So that was my question as a 16-year-old. I don't want to go to hell. I wasn't worried about the United States. I wasn't worried about the kingdom coming. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't want to go to hell. Hell no was my slogan. So I did not need, I did not need the kingdom gospel. You follow? I needed the personal gospel. So when the Philippian jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's talking about salvation personally from hell. And so what is the answer? What does he say? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's that simple. 
That's the personal gospel. That's not the kingdom gospel. That's the personal gospel. By the way, this took place in Philippi. And if that's the kingdom gospel, then Paul is disobeying Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ said only preach that in Israel. You follow? He's in Philippi now. So my point is the personal gospel is completely and totally different than the kingdom gospel. And if you don't study that and, and delineate that and demarcate that, what you'll do is you'll merge the two together, because no one's ever taught you on this, and you'll end up saying all these weird things to the unbeliever about the kingdom and repent for the kingdom is at hand, and that's not what the unbeliever needs. What they need is to believe or trust in Christ alone so they won't go to hell. That's the personal gospel. So we're commissioned with the personal gospel, not the kingdom gospel. And I might like John MacArthur on the book of Genesis. I might like John MacArthur on civil disobedience. I might like him on this. I might like him on that. But I'll tell you one thing about John MacArthur. He's, not, he's got the gospel wrong. And I'll be bold enough to say it. He is preaching a gospel that is completely and totally garbled and confused. And the confusion relates to not understanding basic dispensational distinctives and delineating between kingdom gospel and personal gospel. So, I put this chart together to show the difference. Where do we find the kingdom gospel? Early Matthew. Where do we find the personal gospel? Book of Acts. 16 is a good place to find it. What's the target audience for the kingdom gospel? Israel only. What's the target audience for the personal gospel? All nations. What type of salvation is offered through the kingdom gospel? National. Rome is going to be overthrown. What kind of salvation is offered through the personal gospel? Personal and individual salvation from hell. In the kingdom gospel, how is Jesus portrayed? As national savior and king. In the personal gospel, how is Jesus portrayed? As your personal savior. That's what you say to the lost. You talk about how Jesus is your personal savior. Jesus died in your place. And if you were the only person on planet earth, he still would have died in your place. Because he loves you that much individually to keep you out of hell. That's the personal gospel. That's not the kingdom gospel. That's the personal gospel. The expectancy of the kingdom in the kingdom gospel is the kingdom is eminent. Folks, today the kingdom is not in play. The kingdom is not eminent. The kingdom is absent as we present the personal gospel. What does the, pers- uh, the kingdom gospel contribute to God's program? It contributes the appearing of the kingdom when Israel responds to the offer. What does the personal gospel contribute to God's program? The building of the church. You follow? I'm not out there offering the kingdom gospel to bring the kingdom in. I'm offering the personal gospel so Jesus can use me to keep building his body, the body of Christ. I'm not doing kingdom work. I'm doing gospel work, church work. I'm not doing kingdom work. The kingdom's not in play right now. The offer's been withdrawn. The offer's off the table. What's the scriptural foundation for the kingdom gospel? It's the Mosaic law. What's the scriptural foundation for the personal gospel? Well, I think it's in Genesis 3, verse 15. That's where it starts. I also think it's what Abraham believed. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him for righteousness. I think you'll find the personal gospel in John 3, verse 16, which you no doubt have memorized. And you'll find it in Galatians 3, verse 16, where there's coming an individual seed who will be our Savior. When was the kingdom gospel preached? It was preached in the early gospels, uh, early Matthew, I should say. 
When is the personal gospel preached throughout the church age? Is the kingdom gospel preached today, yes or no? No. Is the personal gospel preached today? Yes. And if you're not preaching it, you're in disobedience to the Great Commission. Preach the gospel to the United States. No. Preach the gospel to every creature. Is the kingdom gospel even available today? No, because the offer has been withdrawn. The kingdom is not in play right now. Is the personal gospel available today? Yes, it is. Now, if I wanted to study the kingdom gospel, what part of the Bible should I study? Now, we have in the New Testament four books called the Gospels. They all portray Christ in a different way. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If I wanted to study the kingdom gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which of those gospels should I study? I should study the synoptics. You say, well, what are the synoptics? In Greek, S-Y-N means same. Optics, you recognize, as in sight or look, similar look. Matthew, Mark, and Luke follow a similar plot structure. Uh, Birth narratives, uh, Galilean ministry, 